So there's this episode where Carmela Soprano, Tony Soprano's wife, she has this anxiety attack. She happens to be sitting in a house with a priest where she says, I'm living in an evil household. And she has to sit at that moment and give confession to the priest. That was deep. Welcome to another sit down with Michael Franzese. Hope everybody is doing well. And it's another Mob Movie Monday. I know it's a favorite of all my followers. We skipped last week because we had interviews with uh, Chaz Palminteri, Dominic Lombardozzi, great guy. These are great actors, people. I know you enjoyed it. Comments have been great, to, you know, just off the hook great. So I, I appreciate that. We got a lot more coming up. Let me tell you about one that I've been uh, talking about hasn't happened yet, and that's with Armand Asante. Armand and I have been talking back and forth, and I'm going to give you a little tip. We were going to do it via Zoom, but on July 23rd in Atlantic City, they're having this huge reunion of the Gotti movie in 1996, 25th year reunion. And a lot of the stars are going to be there. Armand is going to be there. And they asked me to come and participate in some way. And Armand would much rather be in studio sitting down with me like we did with Chaz Palminteri to do the sit down. So we're thinking about it. I don't know if I can uh, put it in my schedule to be there. But if I can, we're going to be in Atlantic City on July 23rd. And I uh, forget what hotel. I think it might be Harris. I'm not sure. But it's going to be great from what I hear. Last year they did the uh, Sopranos reunion and I heard there was like 15,000 people there. It was a real great event. So whoever organizes these, they do a really good job. So might be there. I'll let you know as we get closer. And if that's the case, Armand and I will be sitting down and there might be a few other people that are going to attend that I'll be able to sit down with. So we'll see what happens. So I wanted to put you up to date on that. A lot of other things going on. I can't tell you too much, but we got some good things coming up. I will say this, I want to thank all of you that are subscribing. We're up, I think, over 565,000 subscribers. You've been coming on board a lot. Really appreciate it. Keep subscribing because you get the alerts, you get the new things coming up. And of course, at a million, if we're blessed enough to reach a million, we're going to have another huge giveaway, and it's going to be better than the one at a half a million. So stay tuned on that. MichaelFrancis.com, my crew, we got 17,000 people in the crew. A lot of content, a lot of stuff going on, a lot of good things that we're planning for the crew that are going to be happening this summer. We're going to be getting some live events where I'm going to participate in. We're inviting people for the weekend. We're going to sit down, have a lot of communication, a lot of good stuff, Q&A. Everything is going to be happening during those things. So you got to join the crew. It's free. So what are you waiting for? My inner circle, several hundred people involved. They get a lot more of me. They pay a little bit. It's not breaking the bank. Trust me. Get that unemployment check. Put a few bucks aside and you can do that. But it runs out in September. So do it now, uh, at least here in California. I think all over the country. Only kidding. It won't break the bank. It's cheap, but you get a lot out of it. And I can put you in touch with many people in the inner circle. They're enjoying it, getting a lot of life skill information, a lot of business information, and people are jumping on board in a big way. So that's that. Father's Day is past yesterday. So happy Father's Day again to all of you dads out there. I really hope you had a wonderful day. I did. My family always treats me good on Father's Day. We have two special days, birthday and Father's Day. To me this year, they were super at 70. So hate to say that number, but you know what? It's better than the alternative, not reaching 70. So anyway, that's that. So today, I'm going to do something. A lot of people ask me about The Sopranos. Now, you know I did a little bit on The Sopranos. I can't do the whole series. It's 86 episodes over a number of years, and you can't do it in an hour and just review the entire series. It was a groundbreaking series. Everybody knows about it. It set the tone for all of the other great series that are following, not only in the mob genre, but in every genre. The writing on television and the acting has been terrific, superb, and I really believe Sopranos started at all. We've done Boardwalk Empire. I think I did an episode or two out of that. A couple of the television shows. But you know, the reason I picked this one, I'm doing season one, episode five. And it's about Tony bringing Meadow to view some of the colleges that she might attend. And the reason I chose that, it kind of hit me that episode because you're hearing a lot on YouTube by different people about mob stories, you know, their experiences on the street and the things that we did. You've heard that from me also. 
but very rarely do we hear about the families. We don't talk about it. We don't get into our family lives. And unfortunately for a lot of the guys, family lives did not end up well. Who went to prison, you know, who had indictments. Who, it, it's always, you know, a mess in, in plain English. My life, my family life, you know, with my mom and dad and brothers and sisters and my dad, a mess. Dysfunctional, there's no way to get around it. Those of you that know me, you know about it. We've talked about it in the past. But I think this episode really allows me to talk more about family because, you know, what kind of an impact does the mob life have on families? Not only my own, but across the board. You know, we don't think about that. The moms, the sons, the daughters, you know, everybody involved. It's not a lifestyle that's conducive to a good family life. You know, when somebody takes that oath of omerta, you know what omerta means? It means silence. It means you never talk about the life. You never admit that the life even exists. You never, ever talk about the life. And I got to say, my father, until he was well up in his 90s, and some of you know he did those interviews for Newsday, he never talked about the life. He never gave an interview. He never was in a magazine where he, you know, verbally spoke to a reporter. He wouldn't even admit that it exists. And when you take that oath of omerta, that family life, the mob life, comes before God, comes before family, comes before anything. And you know what? Anytime you take an oath in anything, that comes before God and comes before family, it's wrong. And that's why the mob life, you know, if you sum it all up, it's wrong. Because I took an oath that if my mother was sick and dying, and I was at her bedside, and the family called me to service, I had to leave my mother and go serve the family. Now, how does that sit with you? At the time, I understood and I said, wow, you know, this is something that I'm part of. You know, it's a brotherhood. I got your back. You got mine. It's something that my father was a part of. And it meant something to me. But when I take a step back and I think about it, I'm putting that lifestyle or any lifestyle before God and family. Something wrong with that. People, I'll tell you this. Nothing comes before God and family. Nothing in this life. And if you're a good man, especially, nothing is going to come before your family. When you go into the army or military service, we understand, all right, you're putting the military, that's your life, but you're defending your country, you're defending your family, you're out there to help. Different in the mob life. So you can understand the military is sacrificing, you know, their time with their family, sacrificing their own lives to protect their family, their lifestyle, the things that they believe in. That's honorable. Mob life in that way is not honorable. Now, some people may disagree with me, but I can only admit the truth. And I was part of it for 25 years, so I was a perpetrator of that, and it was wrong. So today, in this episode, I want to review it, and I want to talk about, you know, the impact on the family. And I think you can see it, because Meadow really starts to confront Tony Soprano. So here's how it starts out. Tony is taking Meadow to view some of the colleges. They have a little conversation after they view one college. Meadow starts to open up. She's a teenager at that point, obviously. And she starts to open up about her dad. One thing that she says as they're walking out of one of the colleges, she starts to talk about contraceptives. And Tony goes, wait a minute, contraceptives? You know, he didn't want to hear that from his daughter. Hey, I got five daughters. I don't want to talk about anything sexual or anything intimate like that with my daughters. It drives me crazy even to think about it. Even after they're married, it drives me crazy. Maybe that's weird in your mind. I can't help it. These are my daughters, my babies. I raised them. I brought them up. And it's just hard for a dad to let go in that regard. But anyway, they have that little conversation. And then they get in a car. And for some reason, Meadow, who, you know, if you watch the series, uh, she's pretty independent. She's pretty outspoken. She doesn't hold back. She starts to talk to Tony and ask Tony, her dad, about his lifestyle. What does he really do? She says, Dad, are you in the mafia? And Tony says, mafia? What are you talking about? There is no mafia. Mafia doesn't exist. I'm in waste management. Everybody thinks that, you know, because you're Italian, you belong to the mob. You know how many times I heard that? Joe Colombo, when he started the Italian-American Civil Rights League, you know, that was his rallying cry. If you got a vowel at the end of your name, everybody automatically thinks that you're mafia. And, you know, and sometimes that's true. You know, you're Italian. There is that stereotype. It happens in every ethnicity, you know, in a different way. But obviously the Italian thing, you got a vowel at the end of your name, you're successful, you talk a little rough, you're in the mob, right? So Tony denies it. Meadow's not buying it. You know, they're having that conversation. She's not buying it. Finally, Tony says, okay, you know, you're, you're a woman now. 
you're a lady. You know, let me tell you. And he starts to tell her a little bit about his lifestyle. And he says, look, I make money legitimately. I make some illegitimately. She thanks him. She says, well, at least you're not like mom. You know, you're denying everything. And so he starts to open up and tell her. And it was very telling for me because, you know, with my five daughters, I can honestly tell you, I've never really sat down and talked to them about my former life. Now, they've experienced it. They've visited me in prison. They've seen me get arrested. You know, they know all the thing, but they don't really talk about it. I had one real incident with my daughter, Julia, and that happened a couple of years back. You know, my son, Michael, and I, a lot of times we were, you know, like oil and water, always bunking heads together. And so we were having an argument. We were in the kitchen of the house and I raised my voice and I was getting a little upset with him because he drives me crazy. You know, the one thing about Michael, when I'm trying to correct him before I get the correction out of my mouth, he's already defending himself. And I say, Mike, you don't even know what I'm going to say. And you're defending himself. That drives me crazy. So I was getting a little irritated and she comes running down the stairs and she looks at me and she said, Dad, you're not in the mafia anymore. And that was the first time, like, I said, whoa. I said, what? And she said, you're not in the mafia anymore. You don't do that. You don't kill people. You don't. And she kind of went off at me. And I said, ho, ho. You know, she calmed me right down. I said, calm down. But it, it kind of hit me, you know, that the kids are really thinking about this. They're not oblivious to it. And depending upon the child and their personality, they'll either hold it all in or they'll talk about it. Well, in that case, you know, my daughter was stimulated to talk about it. You know, my other daughter, Mikkel, uh, I can tell you the impact I had on her. She said, you know, I don't want to marry a guy unless he has at least one misdemeanor. You know, <laughs> you know, I don't know if that was a compliment or not, but she was trying to say, you know, I guess that she looked up to me in a certain way, in, in a manly way, or that's what she expected out of a man. I don't know. Anyway, I told her, you don't need a misdemeanor. You need a nice, legitimate guy that's going to take care of you, work hard, take care of the family, love you and, and that's it so I got her out of the misdemeanor thing we don't want misdemeanors but anyway my sister's tremendously impacted by my father's imprisonment especially because he was away just about their whole lives you know how it impacted the family I'm not going to get into all of it now because you know a lot of it you know we've spoken about this before my brother obviously with the whole drug problem my sister with the drug problem I mean it's a tremendous impact on the family so in this scene Meadow is talking to her dad, and she wants the truth out of him. And I really appreciated that because, you know, we got to be honest with our kids to an extent. They're not silly. They're not stupid. You know, their eyes are open. They know what's going on. I mean, when my dad was in that life, I used to get in fights in school. They used to say, hey, your dad's a mafia dad, and we'd fight. You know, so people knew about it. I mean, he was in the newspaper all the time. So you got to explain certain things to your kids. Now, hopefully a lot of you are not in a mob. You don't have to explain that. But, you know, if something is going on, you know, it's good to sit them down and, and maybe talk to them about it and let them understand what is going on in their life so they don't have to guess about it. Anyway, I thought that was a great scene. Okay, and then something happens. Here's another thing that, boy, it really hit me home juggling the mob life when you're a made guy and the family life and boy I can think of so many times when you know that life had such a pull on me you know when you're an active guy like I was soldier and then a cop regime there's so much responsibility that goes with it I mean I literally could have worked seven days a week you know 12 15 hours a day and I almost did and sometimes again it takes priority over your family because that's the oath that you took. It's wrong, but that's what happens. And to juggle your family life with the mob life when you're an active guy, it's not easy. And I remember how I used to try to do that. And I was juggling, you know, my mob responsibilities and my family life. And it was really tough. And a lot of times they were in conflict with one another. This particular time in this scene, they get into a gas station, Meadow and Tony. And while Tony's there, he sees somebody get out of the car and he recognizes the guy. And it just so happens he believes that the guy is a former mobster who turned informant went into the witness protection program and put a lot of guys in prison and uh, as a matter of fact impacted Tony's father in some way. So Tony sees him and now, you know, it's going through his head. I think this is the guy. So he's with Meadow and he's doing the nice fatherly thing. He has to take her to the colleges and participate in that. But what happens now, he's got to find this guy because I'll tell you this, when you know there was a guy in the street and, you know, he was an informant and you spot him, word is out from all five families in New York. You see this guy, you kill him on the spot. And I think I told you at one time, Henry Hill, 
that was the word on him. And you know the story. I saw Henry Hill in uh, Terminal Island Prison. They put him there by mistake because he was segregated from us, separated from us. By mistake, the Bureau of Prisons put him in Terminal Island where I was and a couple other guys. And our orders were at that time, you kill him on the spot. Tony sees this guy. Now, Tony's a boss. And so in his mind, I got to get this guy. So he makes a call to Christopher. Meanwhile, you know, Meadows sees something's going on. She says, hey, Dad, you know, what was with you with this guy? And he said, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing. He makes up some story that, you know, he thought he recognized somebody. I figure, oh, he, or he just puts it on the side like nothing happened. So now there's the thing that he's got to, you know, worry about. I got to take care of Meadow going to school, and I got to worry about getting this guy because that's my life. That's my responsibility. That's my obligation. So he calls Christopher. He tells Christopher about it. You know, another thing that got me, Christopher had to run to a payphone because they didn't have cell phones back then. It's pouring rain. Christopher running to a payphone. I cannot tell you people how many time, how many pay phones I used during that time. And we never liked to go to the same one because the FBI or the local law enforcement, they would go to that booth and they would bug the booth in some way. So I knew every pay phone everywhere in town and I would mix them up and I'd even get my helicopter at times and drive to another place so I could have a conversation on a pay phone that nobody would pick up. My wife used to tell me, why are you always going out on a pay phone? Oh, you know, whatever. She knew, but I wouldn't tell her, obviously. And he tells Christopher, he jotted down the license plate number and he tells Christopher, Christopher, I want you to run this plate and let's find out if this is the guy. Again, he's juggling with Meadow. He's taking her to another school now. And uh, there was a scene there when Tony is following that car. He gets Meadow into the car right away from the gas station and he's following that car because he wants to see, you know, if this was the guy. Again, the mob obligation, Omerta, the pull on you. He's with his daughter and he's still obligated in his mind and in his life to go after this guy who was a former mob guy and now a rat or a snitch, whatever you want to call him. It goes on and throughout this whole episode, Tony is trying to find this guy and trying to appease Meadow. I mean, not appease, do his fatherly duty with Meadow, going to school. So anyway, the former guy, the, the snitch rather, he gets wind of the fact that Tony is following him. Somebody is following him. He doesn't know who. So now he starts to investigate on his own, ask around the people that he knows, hey, is anybody looking for me? It turns out that he does track down Tony Soprano. He finds out that he's in a motel with Meadow. He looks on the log and he sees Tony's name. So now what happens, this guy is going to take Tony out because he knows, you know, if he's spotted, he's going to get killed. So he goes to the motel and Meadow and Tony are walking into the room. Guy's got a gun on Tony. He's about to kill him or shoot him. And another couple from an elderly couple is going into the room next door to Tony. Whether that stopped him or whether he saw Tony with his daughter and that gave him pause, I should say, he doesn't shoot him. It just so happened Meadow was with some of her friends. She had a little bit too much to drink, so Tony's bringing her in, into the room. And the story continues. Now we switch to Carmela, who had the flu. That's why she didn't accompany Tony and Meadow. And she's home, and she gets a visit from the priest. Now, I think, you know, if you saw The Sopranos, you know the whole issue with Carmela and the priest, and so I'm not going to get into all of that. The interesting that happens during that time, and this was so telling, Carmela is talking to the priest, and they're getting into a conversation, and then all of a sudden, Carmela has one of these anxiety moments or attacks, whatever you want to call it, and she said, you know, I'm doing something horrible. And the priest offers at that point to take her confession. So they're sitting on the couch, and they go back to back, and Carmela starts to have confession with the priest. Now, as a Christian, I can tell you, I grew up as a Catholic, and I can't tell you how many times I was in the confessional booth. And I got to tell you this, for all you Catholics, I'm not being offensive. I'm telling you my experience, and we're going back to the 1960s. When you used to get into that booth, I remember Father Thomas O'Donnell. He was a rough priest. And you'd get into that booth and, you know, you'd start to tell your sins and he would yell at you. He'd say, how many times did you do it? How many times? You got to tell me how many times. And he had that kind of voice and it was kind of intimidating. He didn't want to say anything to him. Then if 10 Hail Marys, 17 Our Fathers, go out and, you know, do your penance and that's it. I didn't like confession. I don't think a lot of people do. Maybe, you know, you come out of it and you feel better, but uh, I didn't like confession. And as a Christian, it's just very comforting to understand that we confess our sins to Jesus and Jesus alone. And we can do that in prayer. We can do it sitting in this chair. We can do it at night on our knees, whatever way, as long as we're sincere. Because remember, can't pull a scam on God. He knows our hearts. That's our confession. And it's more satisfying to me that way because, believe it or not, more personal. Just me and the Lord. It's between us. Anyway, that's a telling scene. And in that scene, the important thing is that Carmela practically has a breakdown. 
She says, Father, I live in an evil household. I know what my husband is doing. I brought evil into my house. I brought my children into this evil. I'm allowing it to happen. And I know one day I'm going to be compromised or there's going to be consequences for my sin. She's really, really upset about it. You know, the only thing I can say about this, the wives shouldn't be held accountable on this in most cases because we didn't go home and tell our wives everything that was going on. Now, they might have assumed, they might have suspected, maybe they see something in the newspaper, but we downplayed it all the time. Most of the wives that I met in that life, it wasn't the television show Mob Wives that I hated. I hated the way mob wives were depicted at that point in time. They shouldn't even be called mob wives. And even in the movie Goodfellas, to a degree, I wasn't crazy the way mob wives were depicted because most of them are decent women. They stay home, they take care of the kids. Maybe they don't ask a lot of questions. The husbands don't bring them into the business in most cases. I never saw my father sit down with my mother and tell her about his life. Never seen him do that with any of the kids. What was going on in his life, he didn't bring into the household. And I think most of the dignified mob guys, and you're going to say dignified mob guys, yes. Most of the guys that carried themselves in a different way, they separated their family from that life. Now again, they took the oath, like I did, Omerta, we separated our family, but we took an oath to put the life in front of our family. So it's kind of, a, it's kind of an irony in that, I would say. But I understand where Carmela was coming from, because I know my mom felt that way at some points. I know my wife now would certainly feel that way. She wouldn't want my kids exposed to the mob life, and many of the wives didn't want them. And you know what? Many of the guys in that life didn't want their sons to be part of the life. They wanted them to go to school. They wanted them to get an education. They didn't want them to get drawn into the life. Unfortunately, so many of us did get drawn into that life. Columbo's kids did. Persico's kids did. So many. I mean, I can go on and on and on. There's a lot of nepotism in that life, uh, people. And that's for security reasons also. You know, when you know somebody, you know how they were brought up, you figure they're going to be able to stand up, you know what they're made of, and they can be part of that life. So I get it. But it was a very telling scene where Carmela has a breakdown, doesn't want to bring the family into that life. And I really understood that and related to it. So here you have the wife really recognizing what she's doing, being married to Tony. And you have the daughter now really recognizing that Tony He's got this lifestyle and she's questioning him. It was very interesting. It really hit home to me. So now we do get to the confrontation between Tony and this informant. Tony finds him and gets him and he's choking him, you know, with something, with a cord. The guy is kind of pleading with him. He said, hey, I could have killed you at the motel, but I saw you with your daughter and I let it go. And Tony said, yeah, you know, all you mob guys are same. It's all a con. You'll say anything. Happened to be true. You know, he didn't. He didn't pull the trigger. But Tony, true to his oath, he does kill him. He chokes him to death, kills him, got him on the ground. That's it. He did his deed as far as he was concerned. Cut to, he gets in the car with Meadow. And Meadow notices that his hands are bloody. She says, Dad, you know, what happened? Did you find that guy? Did you get into a fight with him? What is Tony going to say? No, no, no. He poo-poos it off. I caught my hand in the door. I forget what he, exactly what he said. But of course he's not going to sit down and tell his daughter what he did. You know, it does remind me of something. I was on a show. Me and my wife were on a show. I forget the name of the show. It was a couple of years back, but there was a couple other women on there. I think Sammy Gravano's uh, daughter might have been on. I don't remember. But uh, Greg Scarpa's daughter was on. She sat down and she started telling the host of the show. My father used to come home. Greg Scarpa Sr. You know who he was. Grim Reaper. You know, the whole bit. We don't have to get into that. He used to come home and discuss what he did in his mob life, discuss when he killed somebody, discuss what he had to do. He would say right at the dinner table. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. Scarpa was part of our crew. He was a captain with us. When I found out that he was an informant, I was nervous. I sat down with him for years, you know, over many different things that happened during my time in that life. I figured if he's an informant, you know, we're going to have another headache. I already had indictments. Fortunately, he never said anything about me, but he wasn't a guy that you wanted to be around. There was something about Greg that, you know what, you know, look, I don't like to talk about people, especially when they're not around, but he wasn't one of your favorite guys, not a guy that you're going to have enjoyable time with. That was my feeling with Greg. You know, the Grim Reaper thing, you know, he kind of carried himself that way. But anyway, I was kind of shocked to hear that he would sit down at the dinner table and discuss things that he did during the day, during that time. Talk about killing people. I mean, you know, that just kind of tells you what kind of character he was. And again, those of you that know about him, you know about him. Meadow was upset. She was, you know, what happened, Dad? And of course, Tony couldn't tell. 
tell. He, he just made up some story. So it was a very telling scene because I would have done the same thing. You know, it reminded me of a time. I don't think I was married yet to Camille, but we were going out together. We were engaged. We were in Long Island. I was on trial. I was on the Giuliani case, and I had her staying in a house in Syosset. Something happened in my life during that time that we had to tend to, and I had a gun in the apartment. Something happened that we had to act quick. I ran into the house, and I went in and found the gun, and it was a smaller place, it wasn't a big place, you know, that we had secured at the time. And she saw me get the gun and slip it in my pants pocket. And she was, uh, what's going on? She was so nervous. And I said, nothing, 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 don't worry about it. And she got really upset and really nervous. And I felt really bad that I did that in front of her. I didn't realize that she was in the room. It really bothered me because I don't want her to see that stuff. I don't want her to know that stuff. I don't want to talk about it, you know. There's things in that life that I don't want to talk about. I can't talk about it. You know, there's things that, you know, I don't have immunity for certain things that I did during my 25 years in that life. And even if I did, I don't find it pleasant to talk about. That's just me. Other guys can feel the way they do. I don't knock them for it. That's fine. That's the way they, you know, they carry themselves. And that's great. And, uh, you know, some stories are great to hear. So there's good storytellers out there, some of them. But it's not something that I enjoy doing. But anyway, I just remember that incident and thought I would tell you about it. So Tony kind of blows it off you know don't worry about it and so on and so forth all right so they finally get through the whole college thing and they do get home and there is Carmela it's funny Tony goes into the refrigerator first thing as soon as he gets home and he wants the pasta that sounds like me as soon as I get home if you cook macaroni or pasta I want it you know the next day it's great anyway it's gone you know and Tony says what happened and and Carmela tells him that the priest was there and he ate it and Tony says, the priest was there? And uh, Carmela says, yeah, he slept over last night. What do you mean he slept over? I said, I have a little discussion. Went nowhere. Carmela said, stop. You know, what are you thinking? But I got to tell you this, you know, I got to end it with this. This whole thing with Meadow and Tony, it really got to me because dads, I can tell you this. No matter what you're doing in your life, children want to love their parents. You got to give them a reason not to love you. And no matter what lifestyle you're in, I see it that they may disagree with it and they may not accept it in certain ways. But if you give your kids love and it's sincere and they know it, they're going to love you no matter what. Now, there's things that I did in my life that I know my kids don't approve of. You know, my kids are pretty straight laced. They don't approve of a lot of things. But I'll tell you something that I don't approve of with my son. And my kids will call me out on it, especially now that they're adults. If they don't, you know, think that something is right, they're not shy, especially my daughter, Amanda. I know you saw me sit down with three of my daughters and, you know, they have a little bit different personalities, but they're, they're not shy in calling me out if they feel I'm not doing something right. And you know what? I'm not shy in giving them tough love. When you got to discipline your kids, or you got to tell them what's up. You got to do it, man. And they know where it's coming from. You do it the right way. They know when it's coming from the heart or it's coming from someplace else. So all I can tell you is this, you dads out there and even you moms, you know, you got to give your kids a reason not to love you. So don't do that. No matter what your lifestyle is, no matter what's going on in your life, always have time for your family because God and family come first. And that's why no matter what, I'm not knocking the guys in the lifestyle that's not up to me at this point in my life to judge them. They've got their own thing going on, and, and it is what it is. But the lifestyle itself, I had said this, it's a bad lifestyle. It's an evil lifestyle in many ways because of the impact, the negative impact that it has on the family. So remember that. All you young guys out there, you stay away from that life. Remember that. Okay, the way to go is to go legit, you play it straight, and you don't put extra baggage on your back by doing the wrong thing. So that's it for today. So I hope you enjoyed it. We'll be doing some different episodes of The Sopranos. I think with some of these great TV series, I want to pick out episodes that really mean something that I can relate to, because you can't do the whole series when they're two, three years or two, three seasons uh, long. But anyway, uh, so that's it. So how do I always leave you? I always say the same thing, and I'm saying it now, and you know I say it from the heart. Be safe, be healthy, God bless you all, and yes, I'll see you next time.